Uh, good afternoon, everyone. If I could just draw. Not on. It's not on. Do you know how to turn it on? Hello? It is on. It is I need a shout. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? No? Okay, I think I'll... Do I have to kind of crouch into the microphone? <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully as I talk, you'll, you'll hear. I'll be uncharacteristically quiet. I have to say, despite all our markers of success, I think we can say we've made it because a social worker in the room today was quoted in a black taxi troubles tour. Um, <laughs> Karen Trainer, who's sitting in the room, did an interview this morning on Good Morning Ulster, the breakfast show, and other colleagues were taking a, ta a black taxi cab tour around the Peace Walls, and they quoted Karen Trainer by name. <laughs> so, Karen, we've made it. We need to do nothing else at this stage. But really, today and this afternoon um, is all about the participants. It's all about the stories uh, and the voices. It's all about you. The troubles were bad, they were horrendous. That first year was a baptism of fire, literally driving around burning buses and cars and not thinking once about it that it was a problem. Confidentiality meant nothing. You're in our area, you let us know who you are, what you're doing, otherwise you're not welcome and out you go. It was never really addressed, it was just accepted. This was the reality we were living with. The abnormal was, was normal. When I was a probation officer in the West Belfast team, at the same time was forced out of my home, being attacked. Some neighbours were murdered. There was interference, there was disruption. I remember stupid situations where people would sort of probe for your religion and you'd say, it's not important, I'm a social worker. I was working with a team of very committed people within a service that was really trying to make a difference. We laughed together and we cried together and we were frightened together. I suppose as Seamus Heaney put it, whatever you say, say nothing. You knew, but you didn't know there was paramilitary activity going on. The realities then were not talked about and not shared. We didn't quite know what was happening to us. That is the thing that scares me the most, I think. We didn't actually understand very well in the early years of the Troubles what the impact was. It wasn't an easy journey and we were challenging ourselves. When you reflected back then, some months later, you thought, how did I get through that? I think I'm a much better social worker than I would have been if I hadn't had those experiences. It did help us develop and grow and I think we did come out of it stronger. It's important that social workers who have no experience of the conflict do recognise that their profession has a historical context and the skills and knowledge they're taught hasn't just been plucked from the ether. It's good to open this up and let's hear the voices of people who've been through so much. It's about upping the game, about increasing the debate and providing the evidence. It's incredibly, incredibly powerful to watch that video and to hear those stories and we talked about it and thought about it as a group um, when we were making them but we felt it really really important to set the context for us today to remind us that these are the experiences uh, against which we practiced for all those years so we have some more videos to through to show throughout the afternoon um, and I hope you um, receive them, I suppose, how we, how we intended it to be, the voices of the social workers. The project has been a real partnership, um, a long partnership, a long uh, labour of love in, in some ways, um, but it's been a partnership for, for us, Baswa, with our colleagues here, our colleagues uh, across the UK, and, and quite particularly with, uh, with NISC, um, with Colm and Patricia at the Social Care Council. Um, a partnership with Queen's, with Joe. Um, with University College Dublin, with Jim, 
um, and with New York University with, with Carol. Um, but we're also really delighted to be able to host you here today in the Ulster Museum. Um, and that's thanks to Catherine and her team um, that we have been able to partner with them to have you here this afternoon and to offer you the opportunity to see the, the exhibition, Social Work and, or, sorry, not Social Work and Beyond, <laughs> The Troubles and Beyond. Um, before I introduce Catherine, just to say a few words of welcome, just to let you know that in your programmes, immediately after Catherine speaks, we're going to hear from Ruth uh, Allen, the Chief Executive of BASWA, and from Paul Martin, the Chair of NISC, and then we'll head into the, the presentation of the research. Uh, Catherine? Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. And on behalf of National Museums Northern Ireland, I am absolutely delighted to welcome you all here today for the launch of this research on the experience of social workers during the Troubles. Um, when Carolyn and Patricia first came to talk to me about this research, um, I, I, it's so closely aligned to a lot of the work that we've been doing recently that it just felt um, such a logical place for this launch and such an interesting um, partnership potentially for us to develop uh, into the future. As a group of museums here in Northern Ireland, we believe we have an absolutely critical role to play uh, in terms of how we help this society deal with the legacy of its past. Um, we, museums are, are, are shared places, um, but they're also um, safe spaces where by using the objects that we have, we can ask difficult questions um, and we can um, challenge perceptions and we can really help um, build understanding and contribute to our broader uh, social peace process that we have here. And that's been very much um, behind the work that we've been doing over recent years in terms of interpreting our more recent past. We have a difficult history and um, we have a contested history and interpreting it and, uh, and telling that story is challenging. But we've been really grateful for uh, the support of the National Lottery, Lottery Heritage Fund and that uh, has allowed us to uh, employ a curator that gallery, uh, not as something that is complete but is very much uh, the starting point and the starting point from which we want to explore uh, and to develop and to add to it over the months and years ahead. Um, it, is a, it is a gallery where um, we want the multiple perspectives, we're not trying to provide a version of history, but for the multiple voices and the multiple perspectives to exist. And the research that you've done, um, we would really like to explore with you into the future because I think there's a real opportunity for us to look at those voices of social work and the perspective of social workers during the Troubles and how we would incorporate that into the content that we have here. So Karen, who is one of my colleagues and is our, uh, was the curator of the gallery, is here and the gallery will be open for you uh, this evening after it's finished and you're more than welcome to go and have a tour and ask Karen any questions you have. But thank you very much for picking the Ulster Museum to launch uh, this research and I'm really interested to explore it further with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ruth Allen, Chief Executive um, of the British Association of Social Workers, BASWA, and it's a real privilege to speak to you today and to be part of this important launch. When I joined BASWA in 2016 and I heard about this project, I knew then that this would be a really important opportunity for BASWA and for NIST, Northern Ireland Social Care Council, our partners, to fund and support the writing of a crucial part of social work's hidden history, capturing voices and stories that really needed to be told, to be heard and to be understood. And I'm so pleased that the study has got to this point, achieved its aims. Um, and I want to thank all of those involved. Carolyn's already mentioned uh, many people that we want to thank. I want to thank Carolyn and her team here um, in Baswa, Northern Ireland. I also want to thank the former Baswa CEO, Bridget Robb, who was part of initiating this and funding it. I'd like to thank our current and past members of the Baswa Northern Ireland Committee, particularly Marcella and Colin, who are here today, the researchers, of course, um, and also um, to thank uh, Rory Truell, the uh, Secretary General of IFSW, International Federation of Social Workers, also uh, immediate past President Ruth Stark, um, and the current President, Silvana Martinez, who I'm delighted to say is here, because 
we've got global interest in this and they've, they've given their ideas and support and, and Rory and Ruth in particular have supported this project um, right from the outset. And I think it's true to say there is a, there's a global significance about what's happened here. Um, and I'm just going to say a few words about that um, uh, if, you'll, if you'll allow me. Um, I know that for many of the social workers who were interviewed uh, for this study, it was the first time they've had the chance to speak about their experiences, their professional experiences during the Troubles. And the report says that they've ha it's been an, a known but unspoken reality of their professional lives. So this is our first chance um, as a profession to really benefit from their insights and their reflections on this deeply troubling and traumatizing period. So I want to thank the social workers who've come forward to share their thoughts and feelings so candidly, so bravely, as Carolyn said. Um, and it's a privilege to be able to read their words. I was really feeling that as I was reading the reports. What a privilege to actually hear directly from people about their experiences. And I hope their openness and courage in speaking out will influence how we improve support for social workers who practiced in the context of the Troubles, how we recognize their fortitude and resilience, and the, the resilience that so many social workers have shown in Northern Ireland, going about their work, serving communities to the best of their abilities in extreme circumstances. The study also reveals how profound traumas of the past are not and are never really in the past. Interviewees talked about the living legacy of conflict in communities affecting everyday lives now and affecting social work in Northern Ireland as it's currently practiced. And they talk of conflict not being anywhere near over. I hope the study will also influence how social work leaders in the UK and indeed across the world support all social workers in all types of traumatizing situations. There's so many lessons to learn about that. The professional associations, BASWA and the, and the Irish Association also, educators, employers, policy makers, the regulators across UK and Ireland and, and the rest of the world. We all have something to learn from this study, not just in relation to the legacy of troubles, but the legacy that many social workers carry from inherently emotionally challenging and stressful work. Social workers across the world, uh, they work to intervene and support people in the midst of crisis helping people to heal rifts and social hurts. And it's also about preventing harm and helping people build on their own resilience and strengths. It's rooted in human rights and a humanitarian ethical code. It's rooted too in a belief in working to create a just and peaceful society. The decision to undertake this project and tell these stories could hardly have been more prescient we are living in a time of new uncertainties across the island of Ireland and across the UK and Europe. On top of the breakdown in power sharing assembly here, we have disorderly politics, really, and the still unknown shape of Brexit is looming. I said I was going to mention the Brexit word when I was talking to, back, talking to colleagues earlier. It's very serious and it needs to be stated. This research tells us we cannot assume the worst can't happen and that we are beyond civil conflict. It shows us how precious is hard-won peace. But professionally, I think it also shows us how resilient, reflective and committed social workers can be, how we can hold on to our ethics and focus on building relationships even under great duress and help people change in the most divided situations. The report explores many ethical and practical dilemmas that confronted practitioners every day and no doubt the study will continue to raise many questions and be debated about what it all means. And I look forward to hearing more today and from the book that's linked to the study that hopefully will be following later this year. So a particularly strong message for me in the study was that in the midst of mess and ethical challenges, social workers coped they got on with it, and crucially and characteristically, they supported each other. We are so often strongest and most effective when we act and reflect together, a collective global profession with shared values, ethics, and commitment, building hope for the future. Thank you.
bloody hell. Um, I, I, I have to say I have a mixed feeling standing here. First one is I'm absolutely delighted to see so many people that I recognize going back so many years. Um, but the bad news for me is that you're all aging so much better than I am. <laughs> um, but it is indeed, it's, it's a real privilege and pleasure to be associated with the launch of, of this piece of research. Um, and I'm particularly pleased because, believe it or not, 27 years ago, I was summoned to a meeting um, by Faith Gibson, who will be known to most of you, uh, and addressed by herself and her husband, Norman, was asked if I would be interested in working with them on drafting a piece of work focusing on social work through the Troubles. Uh, and of course, my immediate answer was, of course, yes, I'd be pleased to help. I was scared stiff of Faith Gibson, if the truth be told. She was my tutor when I was at the University of Ulster back in the 70s. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't get the monies. Um, and it died, it withered on the vine. But as Phil Hughes was talking to me earlier, I was telling her that story, and she said probably that was much too early to write this story. And I think that's probably right. The timing is now absolutely right. And I want to start, if I may, by thanking and indeed congratulating the British Association of Social Workers for taking this initiative um, and being supported in doing so, obviously, by the Northern Ireland Social Care Council. Um, it does take a bit of courage and, and initiative to move forward and drive forward uh, on a piece of work like this. Um, so sincere th thanks to you both as organisations uh, for supporting this particular effort. But I particularly want to thank the authors. I want to thank uh, Carl, I want to thank Jim, and I want to thank Joe. They have produced a superb piece of work, and I know most of you haven't had the opportunity to read it. I fortunately have, and it's a bit like my first James Bond movie, or book. Uh, I wasn't able to put it down until I got to the last page. It's actually quite a roller coaster um, ride as, as far as a, a read is concerned. It's got, it had for me lots of evoked lots of emotions. Bits of it made me feel quite sad. Bits of it, many bits of it, I had the opportunity to laugh out loud because I was reading it on my own. Bits I giggled at. Um, and other bits I had some sad reflections about. But overall, I have to say, I found it a tremendous read. I actually found it very uplifting. And those who work with me in the Northern Ireland Social Care Council know I tend to prattle on a bit about the need to put pride back into social work. Um, and I have to say this book, this read, actually achieves that. I felt at the end of it quite proud to be a social worker and to have been a social worker. Uh, for me, it's been 48 years, sadly, as you would know by the look of me. Um, but it really did give me a sense of pride to be associated with social work over those most horrible years of, of our troubles. And the quotations, um, I think for me, deserve special mention. I, I love them all, because I think at, at different times in my own career, particularly back in the 70s, I would have used a lot of those myself, not least, I have no idea what I'm doing, um, which was the case when I arrived um, with my Bachelor of Social Science degree from University College Dublin under my arm back in, uh, on the 1st of August 1971. And I was thrown um, or dispatched directly to uh, the heart of the Kingdom of Dalriada, which was better known locally as the Balamoney Welfare Office. And there I, I shared an office with another guy who started in the same day that will be known to some of you. I mean, he was much, much older than I was. A guy called Dominic Burke. <laughs> and five days in, well, two weeks uh, in the office, we were summoned to County Hall to play our part in the fallout from Operation Demetrius. Um, which I'm sure most of you don't recognize, but actually 
was internment, was the army code for internment on the 9th of August 1971. And Dominic and I together were told by the chief welfare officer at the time, well, Dominic, you're going off um, to run a refugee camp in Bally Castle, and Paul, you're going off to run a refugee camp down in St. Aloysius Intermediate School in Cushendall. Um, and I looked at him, given that I was, you know, seven days out of UCD, having had three years hard work and labour in, in Dublin and some party in the middle of it, to be told I was going to set up a refugee camp. So I did ask, I said, what's all this about? And said, well, we really don't know, but you'll know when you get there. Just get on with it. You're going to get about 12, 15 families arriving later this evening from West Belfast and from the White Rock. And I thought, right, but, but what am I meant to do? To which the answer came, just do your best. Uh, and off I went. I spent two weeks looking after Along with others, I quickly engaged the local parish priest in St. Vincent de Paul, and people rallied superbly uh, to help me. Um, and they stayed there for two weeks, and I genuinely, for two weeks, didn't know what I was doing. Um, but we got there, uh, and people left to find that two weeks later I was summoned to County Hall um, to meet the treasurer of the County Antrim Welfare Authority. Um, who sat in absolute horror alongside my boss who had sent me to Cushendall in the first place to be asked, what the heck were you doing? This is irresponsible. What were you doing? As they held up the bill from the local supermarket <laughs> where I had bought ice cream every day for the kids and for the parents as well. And he said, Paul, what, seriously, what were you doing? And I looked at him and I said, Mr. Armstrong, I shouldn't disclose his name, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Armstrong, I was only doing what you told me. I was doing my best. <laughs> so my case was dismissed. But back to the book. Um, my last comment really just want to reflect on where this is going to take us into the future. And as some of you know, I've been working overseas for the last 10 years. In fact, I'm just back at the weekend uh, from, from Jordan. Um, and I'm mentioning this specifically because I do think the lessons in this book, and I know it's only the start and I hope there's more to come, uh, I think do have, will have resonance across many conflict areas in the world. I had in the last two years, I've been meeting Working overseas, you get the opportunity to meet people you wouldn't normally meet, but I've met delegations of social workers from the Philippines who are struggling to cope in the aftermath of the troubles down in Mindanao. Um, I've had contact um, and engagement with a deputy director of social services in Colombia, and they're wanting us to get involved in Colombia from September or something like that, to work with social workers in the aftermath of their conflict. And obviously where I'm working at the moment, um, it, it struck me after reading this, uh, how important this book is. I had occasion last week when in Jordan to meet with a group of social workers working in uh, Mafrak, which is the town close to the Zatari refugee camp. Uh, and it was amazing listening to them. They were, um, Paul, well, actually they called me Mr. Paul in Jordan. Much more respect from Jordanian social workers than ever. <laughs> than I ever got from any of you lot, but that's another story. <laughs> That'll be another chapter for the book, Joe. Um, but genuinely, they, they, they were asking the questions that this book highlights so well around what can we do? We've no direction, we've no support. Um, we don't know what we're doing. And, and I was able to, to offer some help, I think, by talking, as the book does, about the importance of resilience <laughs> the importance of neutrality and the importance of regardless of the dangers you're operating within, always keep focused on the needs of the people that you're working with. And my God, how difficult is that in a place like Zattery with 80,000 refugees and uh, you know, having come from the most horrendous violence in, in southern Syria, Aleppo and Homs and so on. So, I, I know Joe has told me that there is the intention to produce a further publication later in the year. I certainly look forward to that. Um, but I do think 
the lessons that are spelt out in this book and drawn out further have real potential to support social workers across the world, and particularly those social workers working in conflict areas. So to all of you involved, once again, my heartiest congratulations on a, a superb job. Thank you. The Troubles were like a backdrop to our work. And whilst a lot of work went on very normally and with no difficulty, that anxiety about the Troubles was there in the background. As individuals, we ran the risk of running into events. The abnormal was, was normal and it wasn't particularly different. I came from South Armagh. And my first social work job was in North Belfast. By and large, very good relationships with, with the families I worked with, but you'd walk into a room and people would have been having a conversation about what they did at the weekend and that conversation would stop. Having the name Eamon didn't necessarily go down too well in some paramilitary housing states in the Cool Rain area. Some of the locals in the bog side thought that I was a, an undercover RUC agent and was approached. We didn't get into political discourse, we didn't get into analysis, we just tried to serve the people we were meant to serve, people who had been placed on probation. I got to know people from Northern Ireland, so I'd visited quite a lot before I came, and I had gotten over that feeling that, you know, I'd be some, I'd be unsafe or, you know, I'd be putting myself at risk. And one of the things that I was very mindful of in the work that I did with the young people was the paramilitary presence in the community. And not so much as it impacted on me, but as it impacted on them. Lots of times things were quiet, things didn't happen, and then all of a sudden there could be an attack. Our office was hit by a rocket and was damaged, so we were out of our probation office. There was that tension in the background, and as the team, we supported each other. We knew what was going on, and we knew to take care. There was disruption. Nobody was saying, well, we'll take your caseload off you, or, you know, you still had to keep going. You had the parents to consider, and you had the children to consider, and all around you. There was mayhem, there were people knocking at the door, wanting to know who you were. Confidentiality meant nothing. You're in our area, you let us know who you are, what you're doing, and who you're visiting. Otherwise, you're not welcome, and out you go. You were maybe in the middle of a housing estate and trying to do child protection work, and everybody was like in a mass exit from that housing estate. So you did things to protect yourself, so you would have used pseudo names. I was never um, Philomena. People would have called me Felicity or Phyllis. As a manager, I was also very concerned about staff who, for one reason or another, were at risk and sending staff out into situations where they could be exposed to danger. And I do recall on, on, on occasions asking staff not to go out on certain occasions. Having been brought up in very leafy, very quiet, very Protestant East Belfast, not really knowing much about the troubles except what you saw on the TV. There were lots of secretaries and things who worked on the perimeters, but they weren't into the H blocks. When you're surrounded by a group of paramilitary prisoners who are staring at you and only one is talking, and you know it's a tactic to ask you to phone home or do a message for them of some sort. But before that, they said, we like the color of the new car that you're going to get next week. They were able to tell me what my registration number was, and I didn't even know it. And that's what was happening every day. But we still had our job to do as child care and child protection social work staff. And at times you were maybe naive and the adrenaline got going and you went into situations. I'm not exaggerating, there was a helicopter ahead and there were two army land rovers and myself and two staff to take children in the care. There was no script for this. Nobody had told us how to do this. We kind of made it up as we went along. And whilst we tried to be very professional about it, we were also trying to be very human about it. 
And the team was made up of people of different political backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, that worked together positively. There was a common bond on those very good relationships that, that kept you going. We were able to develop a network of communication and support that actually saved a lot of people, that were able to connect them again to have their voices heard and to make sure that they weren't completely downtrodden and lost in the darkness that was around at that stage. We didn't talk about it. It wasn't acknowledged. It became the norm. I suddenly realised that is so abnormal as a way of practising. But ironically, I don't think it actually got in the way of our good practice under these hugely abnormal circumstances. Did you hear that disruption that went on there during that? Uh, <laughs> it didn't even phase you, did you notice that? <laughs> um, in preparing for today, where is that? I am so glad to hold this, feel it, and see it written. And it was delightful, Paul, that you said it was a, it was a nice read, believe me. As a, leading this research over the last number of years, it's just we couldn't wait really to get to today, sure we couldn't. And uh, there was a lot of, I'll not say blood, sweat and tears, but there was a lot of uh, effort going on in the background, as you can imagine. So you, in these uh, short presentations with uh, myself and Jim and Carol, you're going to get a snapshot of what we think are the sort of key findings of the research. Um, hopefully the report is written in a way that you'll, you'll get to that information very quickly uh, because we intended it to be, to be like that. But equally important for today was about hearing the voices of social workers. And uh, as I was listening to the voices, I could actually see people nodding, thinking, yeah, I know, what, I know what he or she means by that. And, uh, but I think that one of the most important things that we teach our social work students in education is about person-centeredness, about respect for persons, and about putting the person first. And I think the challenges that uh, the social workers talked about there in film, on film really typified and really do typify what that actually looks like in practice. Um, we have examples. Oh, better. You think I would know how to use a clicker after all these years teaching students? Um, so here are just a, a summary of some of the, the, the key points. But the challenges that uh, were portrayed by the social workers on film there, I suppose they formed the backdrop to the everydayness of what they were having to deal with, because fundamentally, the role and task of a social worker is about trying to help people in need, first and foremost, but um, also helping people who are in crisis. But when the backdrop of your context is also characterized by crisis, you can imagine just how difficult that is to actually fulfill the protective functions that you have to help children, to help other vulnerable populations, which really formed the backbone of what we as social workers we're doing during that time. So um, I had a few notes here, but I can't see them. So I'll just talk my way through this here. Um, enduring daily disruption to practice, such as roadblocks, personal threats, bomb scares, sectarianism, working directly with paramilitaries. I mean, some of the social workers that we interviewed said, look, there's too many. I had too many threats. There's just not enough space during this interview or during in, in my response to this survey to give you examples, but there's something in the region of nearly 3,000 instances of social workers experiencing roadblocks, bomb scares, direct, direct intimidation, uh, sectarianism, personal threats. So you go out to fulfill these very important protective supportive functions that characterize the nature of your professional role and that's what you encounter, and yet you still do it. You still get on with the job. Of course you're threatened. That's a very difficult thing to experience, but you have to go back. You have to go back the next day. You may even have to go back later that day. You don't take leave because you know people need your help. They need you to be there. They need you to be on the front line. You talk to your colleagues, but you don't talk to your colleagues about the elephant in the room, but you talk to your colleagues can you see the conceptual ambiguity within that? 
you're dealing with paramilitaries. You're dealing with people who have experience, who are wedded to violence and violent means. One of the core principles of our jobs as social workers is to promote the safety and welfare of, of people who are in need, people who are vulnerable. So again, there's another conceptual ambiguity in terms of the people that you have to engage with and the people who are out there who need your help the most. So social workers, during this really difficult period, we're trying to make all, do all, all that balancing when this wider societal milieu was characterised by chaos and danger. 62% of the people, the social workers that we surveyed in this research, said that they felt at risk. So feeling at risk, getting up in the morning to go out and do your job. So it's, it's, we really welcome the fact that we have done this now for the first time. We've looked at it in a very microscopic way. We've spent a lot of time at it. We've looked at it very carefully. Anecdotally, I was a senior social worker myself in family and childcare. I was aware of it and I was leading this research, but at the same time, I nearly wanted to be interviewed, but I knew I couldn't interview myself because I had so many experiences myself. And I'm looking at some colleagues here that I worked with that, that characterized that particular backdrop as well. Um, I was particularly keen that we had the voices of social workers who were in the front line of some of the worst atrocities in Northern Ireland. And Carolyn mentioned some of those earlier, uh, like Tiban, like Enniskillen, <coughs> like Oma, and the Shankill, Shankill bombing. And there are a couple of examples in there that are very moving, they're very emotional. And I, I must say, when I wrote the conclusion to this in New York last week, I was in tears at the end. So when you're looking at concluding observations, this to us, this was a piece of research that was very emotional to us because we were all very, very close to it. We were in it ourselves. When we hit the record button in those interviews, people just wanted to talk. And I mean, sometimes I say, to, I say to my students, the best interviews are the ones where you ask the least questions. And people just wanted to talk and they trusted us. And I'll talk in a few seconds just about the, the underpinning methodology to make sure to making sure that people did trust us. But our colleagues were on the front line. They were there helping people in their greatest hour of need, dealing with these awful atrocities, but really going without sleep. And I mean, working tirelessly from, in the, in the case of the Oma bomb, Saturday afternoon right through to Monday morning. But not only helping support people at their greatest time of need, but also been tuned into the fact that policy needed to be developed. So people were forming and developing policy really quickly at a point of crisis. So you, you can imagine, and I'm sure there are people in the room who were there who remember what those atrocities were like and how difficult that, that was to provide people with the support they need, but also thinking how social work needs to adapt structurally to actually be more responsive at a systemic level in terms of providing the support that these people need. I've mentioned there a bit feeling, feeling at risk for most of the time doing the job. And again, that was very, that was characterized. I mean, we have examples of, I mean, one social worker talked about going through a front door that was baby trapped. We have a social worker who talked about driving in front of a police car and the, the army when there was a worry that the road was actually, that there was a landmine on the road. Uh, we have an example of a social worker who was working with a client who, who had a firearm. And then you had examples of social workers who were dealing directly with people who were involved in the paramilitaries. And again, the sort of conceptual ambiguity about the stuff that you had to engage with that was very much at odds with the underpinning ethos of our profession and what we stand for. Um, so, the other thing was, and I say this as an educationalist, the three of us are, are educationalists, Del I'm delighted that since 2003, our social work students in Northern Ireland are now being taught directly about what's referred to in the curriculum as the Northern Ireland context. When I graduated in 1985 from the University of Ulster, I didn't get anything on that context. Neither would our colleagues here. So, we had our social workers in Northern Ireland on the front line being ill-equipped educationally um, um, in terms of social work education and training to actually fulfill the requirements of this very, very challenging professional milieu that they were engaged in. 
Thankfully, things have changed now, but on the back of this research, I can definitely see the way in which we can do it even better, and that that Northern Ireland context now will not only involve, importantly, listening to the views of people that have direct experience of being victims and survivors of the troubles, but listening to social workers, listening to the social workers who, who are here in Northern Ireland, who have amassed this wonderful uh, experience that they can discharge and that they can share with our students. And I know there are some students here today who have been taught about this very recently. And I can see the way in which we can actually develop this even further. I remember in the team that I worked with, uh, whenever we were dealing with difficult situations, uh, whenever we had been threatened, you come back, you had a cup of tea, you maybe put your arm around your friend, and you said, I know it's difficult, but you didn't talk about the elephant in the room, which was, do we know why it's difficult? Do we know why personally this is making it difficult for me in terms of my own psychobiographical background, in terms of my own religious identity? The fact that I've had to change my name, I've maybe had to skip my first name, the fact that I've had to deal with somebody challenging a professional decision that I've made based on the perception that they weren't going to get a fair deal because of the, the way my surname sounds. So all of those sort of conceptual ambiguities that I've referred to earlier, the way in which social workers had to deal with these issues day and daily, but they got on with it. And that was a, an expression that was used time and time again to the point that I actually wrote it up on the board in my room, um, that we just got on with it time and time again. And, you know, that just getting on with it, so you got on with the job, but we didn't talk about the process of getting on with it. So there was this sense still, and this, Jim has written about this with colleagues, this sense of neutrality, this sense of sitting on the fence, and a sense of benign detachment. But it's easy to criticize and say, well, you know, why didn't we? But to do so actually would have been very difficult. And that was one of the questions we were asked today in the, in the talkback interview. Why are you doing this and why are you doing it now? We're doing it now because hopefully we have a safer occupational space within which these very, very important testimonies and these very important experiences and these very important narratives can be told. So I am delighted to get to this point today. Um, oh, I have one other slide. Hold on a second. I forgot to say this, the methodology. <laughs> I just got straight into the findings there and I forgot to say how we did it, but I'll briefly go through this. The word ethics never took on as much meaning for me. <laughs> and uh, Carol would be on Skype calls with me from New York saying, Joe, have you not got ethical approval yet? And I said, no, Carol, we need to take our time with this. Um, we need to do this right. Um, I had to get ethical approval from six different uh, uh, structures and systems in Northern Ireland. And you know, when we look back now, we feel that we, we feel that we have exercised a very responsible duty of care towards the 130 people that we worked with. And people in the interviews were very clearly saying, look, Joe, who's going to see the data? Who's going to see the information? Where's it been stored? Um, how can we be sure that this is safe? So, I mean, I was able to answer all those questions in an authoritative way as a researcher, because we had gone through these types of necessary protections in a very careful and considered way because it was only right, because we had people sharing these very personal um, circumstances with us, these very personal experiences with us, and we had a duty to make sure that we, we dealt with that information very carefully and very responsibly. So we, we had an online survey. Many of, you, many of you in here may have completed that. Um, 103 people, we had 103 respondents, um, 102 people completed it, and we then proceeded to do uh, in-depth interviews with 28 respondents. So we feel that we have a piece of research now that is very strongly evidence-informed, and, and we wanted the report to be really strongly perforated with the voices of social workers. Um, and just to finish then, yes, we were dealing entirely with the period 1968, or 1969, I beg your pardon, to 1998. Now, we feel there's another job of work to be done in terms of 1998 until now. 
but we'll mention that again later. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Jim after we have a little, another clip of the voices. So I'll move on then. When we were here, we didn't really talk about it. We didn't talk about the context in which we were working. At a kind of educational level, at a training level, at a policy level, we hadn't really properly understood about what the impact of the violence was on people. The research is the first time that I think people have actually taken stock of what social workers did. And I thought, brilliant, for the first time, social workers are given a voice and are able to tell their, their stories. I suppose as I understood it, the research was about learning from the experience of social workers during the Troubles, exploring a bit how that impacted on social work, how we managed to continue to deliver a service and what sort of service that was. The research was a real opportunity to just open this up a wee bit, have a look at what social work actually did to improve the outcomes for service users. I think it also captures how we were normalising working in an abnormal working environment. I think that it's an opportunity to highlight the resilience of the social work profession. I wanted to have the opportunity to contribute to something about why we can't as a profession be passive. We have to be active in our response to being change agents and making a difference. The health and social services individual workers were carrying their own anxieties about the troubles and Meanwhile, they were also trying to provide services to a community that was in conflict. It sort of brought back to me how stressful things were, but you dealt with it, you know, and you laughed off stuff like that. It was a measure of how stressed I was that I thought for a moment that this shadow that I saw through the glass window on my front door, maybe was someone coming to get me because of events that had happened the day before. In 2019, we still have sectarianism. I can't remember how many peace walls and defensive barriers, as so many of them are called, but we still have. With communities and yet another generation growing up in the shadow of those, significantly affecting their mental health. I talk to lots of very young social work students and sometimes don't see the historical context of some of the behaviours and needs they encounter within families. They may encounter someone with a disability, but the origins of that disability may lie in the conflict. You only have to scratch a little bit under the surface and there's still quite a lot of tension around A, your identity and who, who you represent. In the 80s, 90s, there were concerns about social work practice. Did we need to look at how we were responding to people from the different religious communities, been sensitive to people's backgrounds, showing respect, acknowledging where they're coming from. Nobody really tracked that to see how well that actually got embedded into practice. So the idea was, as we as social workers, are we working with both communities in an anti-sectarian way? And I think it was revisiting that and seeing where we are. We're informed by victims and survivors. We're learning a lot more about the impact of a divided society. We need to learn from practitioners who went through similar experiences. To not have the voice of social workers in there, it's like the final piece of a jigsaw. I feel that the research will be able to be used both locally, nationally and internationally to really harness the energies of social work to make it drive forward further changes. We learnt a lot about ourselves. I think we sort of grew as a profession during the conflict. As a profession that values reflective learning, I think we should reflect on those times and look at what made us resilient, what we got right, what we didn't get right. As the situation in Northern Ireland has improved, we're on a journey to recognising what we considered as the norm. We've begun to understand that as very abnormal. In a sense, I nearly see it as part of a recovery process. And I think if we don't do that, we're losing, I think, a vital part of our social work history. Afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. What a wonderful occasion to be here. Um, I feel very privileged to be here. The emotion in the room is palpable, I think. It feels very real to me and to my colleagues who were involved in the research. Um, 
I've been an academic for 30 years, nearly 30 years, it's hard to believe, and probably some of you in the audience think it's hard to believe I've been teaching for 30 years. But um, basically, I've never really been involved in such a profoundly important piece of research. Maybe it's because I'm Belfast boy and man grown up here. Maybe it's because pra my practice was involved in social work during the 1980s particularly. And I've been, been doing a lot of teaching at Queen's over the last 20 years, but it is such a very important piece of research that I'm, I feel very privileged to be involved in, and mostly privileged because of the people who, the participants who give so much for the research. So what I'm going to do is try and tell you what I think are the key themes that emerged from the research in the past, in the, in the, in the middle period, and, and uh, as we go forward. And Carl is going to talk about the forward-looking bit. Um, just, just from a researcher's point of view, um, it's important to point out that <clears throat> there's, a, there's a concept called insider status. This is where the person who interviews the other person, the respondent, has actually knows something about them or they might be part of the same community. And I'm sure, perhaps, particularly Joe and I, felt this during the interviews that we were getting lots of insights, not just about the people who were telling their stories, but insights about us, the researchers, as well. And Joe alluded to it. We had to try and be as, as objective we, if you can in this sort of research, not to get too involved in the storytelling. But at the end, I guess Joe alluded to this, I would have loved to have been interviewed myself or engage with a respondent because it meant so much for us as, a, as professions, professionals in this community. Okay, I'm just going to go through my wee presentation here and, and try and tell you a bit about what I think are the key themes from the research. Well, of course, today is so important, a crucial opportunity for us all as a professional group to reflect upon these tumultuous events, tumultuous events and their impact upon clients and social workers themselves. And I think there are probably three or four explanatory concepts which are helpful here. One is the notion of trauma. That is the trauma of the clients that the social workers were trying to deal with. But mo perhaps most, just as importantly, were, was the vicarious nature of the practice. When I say vicarious, it means almost like a secondary traumatization. The, the social worker themselves having to listen to these horrendous stories or very traumatic incidents or stories, that they themselves take this on board, try to contain it, and try and take it away and deal with it. And a lot of the stories in the report sort of relate to this issue about traumatization. Um, there were stories of memories, of course. Um, we've heard some of those on the very profound clips um, that you've heard from some of the respondents. And recovery is, is quite an important notion because it's only in recent years, maybe in the last decade, that the notion of recovery has become important in social work. Often we worked in um, quite negative ways in thinking about disease or illness paradigms. Now we can see that clients with quite profound difficulties can have recovered some recover, recovery in their lives. And it's the same for the social workers who try to help these clients. They are, in a way, through this research, I believe, recovering part of their history, recovering parts of their identity, and also recovering issues of their trauma or trying to think through the difficulties that they experienced. And then there, of course, are the positive things you'll find in the report. There are issues of coping and resilience, amazing stories of coping and resilience. And also, perhaps most importantly, and I think Paul and colleagues, uh, Caroline alluded to this, issues of commitment to best practice despite the horrendous situation that everyone seemed to be in. So for me, it seems to me that participation in the study has been cathartic for the respondents and for those of you that will read the report. It is for colleagues an opportunity to try and understand what happened understand the nature of their role in the conflict. It was as though the survey and the interviews allowed this past to be recovered, as I've said, and importantly, contextualised in the present today as we think about it. This sense of catharsis is quite evident, not just in the many interviews, but in the very powerful visual testimonies that we've just witnessed. Um, it's a real privilege to witness those. This notion of recovery was palpable in the interviews that we carried out. 
But I think we all agree that there's still a lot more to be done. We have to look to the future, as, as we've already said, and see what we can do about this. As one, one respondent put it, we still don't have any mechanisms to offload this history, this backstory, the bad but also the good parts. Working through and living through this period in our past has made me a much more resilient person. However, only a fool would not acknowledge this came at a cost. And I'm not sure this, is, this has repercussions even today, so many years later. When you read the report, you'll find numerous accounts of the very difficult situations that the social workers find themselves in, often very, very high risk, not just to themselves, but to um, their families and friends. This included encounters with paramilitaries, security force members, and clients. Respondents, you'll find when you read the port, report, cited many incidents involving bombings, shootings, sectarian threats, which are embedded throughout the report. It seemed to us as researchers that perhaps for the first time, these moments were being recovered and reconsidered decades later. The social workers are quite vivid in their recollections of specific events and were sometimes shocked and surprised that they managed to carry this sort of practice out in the midst of such carnage and loss. The following response captures some of these feelings. This interview is probably the first time that anybody has ever actually formally said, how has it been for you being a social worker or even an individual or anything else in the middle of all this? So I think the report is very powerful in helping us understand how people feel looking, looking at this past. In the report, there are important accounts of how the social workers dealt with the aftermath of valid incidents and threats, which at one level indicated remarkable levels of resilience and coping skills. Yet, as with other professionals at the time, it was apparent that there were few systems of, report, of support, particularly during the er early years of the Troubles. As the fabric of society was torn asunder, then health care and social work professionals were left to make sense of practice and create spaces which were unusual interventions often took place. For example, and we've heard some of this in the testimonies, where people were admitted to psychiatric institutions, children had to be taken into care, and the probation service navigated with political prisoners. So it's hard to really look back and, and try and understand how profound those experiences were for the clients, but importantly for the social workers. So as one respondent said, the trauma I experienced still is with me, and I accept I haven't fully processed it. And therefore, at some level, and therefore at some level does have the effect of re-traumatizing me when dealing with crisis and risk, even as they've grown out, grown out of the troubles and in their everyday practice, these memories and trauma still remain. With all this going on around them, some social works actually reflected upon how they coped in, some, in such circumstances. At times, they were determined to hold the line on professional practice and social work ethics, a very, very powerful message in the research despite the pressures to avoid and ignore the needs of very vulnerable clients, especially at the height of the Troubles. And as we, yet as we move towards the Belfast Agreement and a more positive vein, it's possible to envisage how some practitioners and agencies were able to make sense of the role that they had to deal with traumatic after effects, particularly after major events that Joe has, has spoken, spoken about. So as one person said, I suppose 40 years ago, we thought trauma was an injury and, the, and that the emotional trauma, and emotional trauma, people didn't really grasp this at that time. Whereas now I think, and I think this is probably true in the last decade, decade or two, we're better, better at recognising trauma, the very individualised nature of trauma and the very, very personalised response to that trauma. And I think agencies, and I think this is true, have got better at the right, right across services in dealing with such issues. And, and importantly, social workers took their place amongst other professionals when these events took place. And they delivered expert services, just like other professionals. But yet, some, we still worry that the lessons, we haven't quite 
altogether le learn the lessons from the past. I do. Okay, then, what then did we feel as researchers this meant in terms of social workers' understanding of their role and function? Really, as you've heard, many seem to accept risk and normalize very abnormal situations, as you've heard. Well, this does appear in societies in conflict um, where it is a routine response when life and well-being is placed in such jeopardy. In some ways, the social workers were simply acting, thinking and behaving like the, general, the wider population. Some of you in the audience were thinking that you were, you're not social workers, but you were thinking and behaving in this way during the Troubles. And the following quotation reflects this view. These events were the norm as opposed to the reality. And therefore, we have become desensitized to abnormal events in the here and now. And in my opinion, whether rightly or wrongly, and this is the, a sort of positive thing, we're more able to deal with them professionally because we turned, as a profession, the abnormal into the, uh, to the normal. And that enabled practice to happen. When we read about how social workers were caught in crossfire between the army and the paramilitaries or were threatened because of their religious or cultural identities, these issues are palpable. Week upon week, month upon month, year upon year, social workers turned up for work, worked very long hours, often unrecognised, and delivered many untold acts of kindness and support for individuals, families, and communities. Now, Joe has already mentioned his idea, the thing in his whiteboard and work about getting on with it. And as you read the report, you'll see this coming up quite a lot in the narratives. Um, getting on with it, with it happened often in the absence of agency support. When you read the report, you'll find many examples of getting on with it. For some, it was an expression of practice that had to avoid discussions of politics in the office because that was too anxiety-provoking, it was too dangerous to do. Getting on with it meant meeting the needs uh, of the everyday, every routine, everyday routines of meeting the needs of clients. But this had actually a sort of perverse effect in not being able to speak about the conflict with, in, the, in the office amongst our colleagues sometimes. It had the effect of closing down dialogues or space in which recovery could take place. As Jerry Heary said in his testimony, whatever you say, say nothing, as Seamus Heaney's quotation is often used. Now, these uh, responses were not surprising. Even today, 20 years after the signing of the Belfast Agreement, we have politicians, civic leaders, and communities who are struggling to create this space and to have such dialogues. And perhaps for us as a profession, we can move on. We can understand the past, but we can't do it alone. We need leadership from politicians, we need leadership from the civic community so that we can build alliances to make sure we understand the legacy of the past. Now many social workers explained how they were determined to protect uh, professional standards. This is a very honourable and positive aspect of the report. Um, to protect the needs and rights of clients despite such profound impediments and blockages. And the introduction to the report explains this very nicely. Social work values appear, appear as a compass, a guide for social workers in Northern Ireland through these most challenging of times. Participants demonstrate an unwavering commitment to social work values, always putting the person first, regardless of personal risk. Such a commitment to respond to those in need is something for which social workers, everyone in the room who's worked, and all those who cannot be here today, can be individually and collectively proud. And I think that's a very important message for you to hear today. So um, the, interestingly, these principles were translated into quite interesting novel approaches to practice to try and deal with the sort of perverse and quite weird nature of the, 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 the conflict that was in, in front of them. Um, where casework, traditional casework approaches weren't viable or appropriate to the needs of um, to clients, then community development interventions were constructed. 
And as the decade passed, and as we began to understand more about the nature of trauma, then an expertise developed, particularly after the OMA bombing and the Enniskilling bombing, the Shangle bombing, then social workers amongst other professionals began to understand that they actually have the skills to deal with trauma, and they can understand the impact of trauma upon themselves. Okay, I'm just going to end now with a, a final few points, trying to tie together what I think are, are the, the most, perhaps one of the most important messages for the research. And I think we have a set of sometimes contradictory feelings about the, the, the study and the report in the, in the way that the respondents talked about their experiences. On a pessimistic but understandable note, as discussed earlier, it, was, it is probable that there are a lot of unresolved issues left with the practitioners. And, and we hope, and hopefully this has been a positive experience, that for those who participated in the study, particularly those who were interviewed, will find that there was a catharsis, that perhaps it raised a lot of difficult feelings for them, but at the same time, it helped them understand how they feel about the past. Um, and there's another point. I think I think Kieran makes this make, makes this argument in his testimony that somehow there were profound issues going on, had a profound impact on the practitioners, but. Um, there were important lessons to be learned about how our identities changed in the midst of conflict, and perhaps in terms of gender, um, religion, class, um, and other other types of identity, and religion, of course. And I think we all change because of the troubles, and we have to try and find ways, positive understandings of how those changes occurred. Um, and these experiences, I think, are worth considering the complexity of how we change during the troubles. And there is one concept which is used in literature, which is contested, but which is useful. It's called post-traumatic growth, which we wouldn't have used, though that term like recovery wouldn't have been used 20 years ago. But paradoxically, the idea of post-traumatic growth is that even though you may encounter these difficult situations, and particularly in situations of political conflict, there, are, there can be positive outcomes for you, your clients, and the wider society. When people can talk about their experiences in safe places, when organisations and clients understand and respect the positions that we have taken, and if there are adequate family and community supports, then a sense of growth can occur. In fact, if we look back, and some of the practitioners might be doing this, this moment or when they were interviewed, you can look back and, and figure out these were traumatic days that we lived in, but we can understand there were positive things were going on in our lives. So it may be that if we as a profession, through the British Social, Social Workers in Northern Ireland, and through our regulator, the Northern Ireland Social Care Council, the educational institutions, Queen's, University of Ulster, the colleges of further education and other educational institutions, and perhaps most importantly, the agencies who employ social workers nowadays. We really need everyone to create safe spaces, and then the social workers from the past, present, and the future will be able to deal with the impact of the troubles in ways that are purposeful, imaginative, and bound to rights-based approaches to clients. As another participant put it, I think social work has a unique place in creating a voice for the legacy of generations that are here and have lived through, that are here and have lived through. So this sentiment finally points to a more optimistic future, where social workers incorporate the lessons from the past and build upon the rich and important contributions that they have made in dealing with the effects of the troubles as we look to the future. Thank you. Looking back over the years of research into the impact of the troubles on the community, it's now very clear that we didn't actually. Looking back over the years well of research in the into the impact of the troubles on the, the community, 
It's now very clear that we didn't actually understand very well in the early years of the Troubles what the impact was when various researchers were beginning to identify very marked levels of psychological problems in the Kenyan history, and particularly amongst those who had been directly exposed to acts of violence. If we'd had that information earlier in, in the history of the Troubles, we would have been able to do things a lot differently. And the Uma bombings. And one of the things we looked at I was involved in managing in services to the following was the, the Haskellan and the Uma bombings. And, and one of the things we looked at very closely well. in the response to the Uma bombing was the impact of health and social care staff. And, staff. and that obviously involved social work staff as well. It's very clear that those staff who had been directly involved in responding to the bombing had psychological for example, consequences which were approximate to those who were witnesses hospital. on the People street in Oma when the, the bomb exploded. Center, which was used for example, doctors and nurses those um, and other staff working in the hospital. The People These working in major the leisure center which was used to try so and were identify those who were missing and subsequently to identify as well as this wider These community. had major impacts on health and, health and social care staff. So there were these very direct effects going on Somebody as well as this wider community anxiety about the violence. Now I think I be much better equipped Personally, in terms of somebody really starting out now, I think I would want them to be much better equipped personally in terms of really what understanding bring to the, the realities of the job. And, and nowadays, we recognise there's another component because the, like what we as individuals it, bring to the dynamic. My students to understand and that I think we've got a lot better at because people like me didn't have it. And it is that's safer, what I'm trying to get my students to understand. That will be with us for years to Things come. have moved on a lot, and thankfully, it is safer. But it has still left a big legacy that will be with us for years to come. You need good support systems. Because if you don't have those, it leads to compassion fatigue and eventually burnout. I would like uh, out of, of the this would be to ensure that there are good supervision, peer support, and an acknowledgement of the complex environment social workers are operating in. And the impact of through social work, we've we been able to help people to live during those troubles, and more importantly, dealing with the aftermath and the impact of the troubles. We can because apply some of these practices and techniques now the and have better the outcomes than we even did in, in terms of the troubles. Because for me, social work was the catalyst to change during the troubles by building a network impact, and a framework of structures around them and around their communities. I think looking back on it, there undoubtedly was an impact. There was a challenge then in having to engage with people in that more neutral fashion when, when actually some of the issues we were engaging with had the potential to raise a lot of distress or a lot of questions or querying to, to if others, there are, so are lessons to be learned or experience well. we're increasingly is, recognizing is how giving to, the, to the others then that's an important thing to, on individuals to do as well we're increasingly recognizing how the long-term impact of trauma on individuals on families the intergenerational impact of trauma and i think social workers now need to realize that they may be working with people I think it's and important the origins that we of the continue issue to learn they're encountering the may be uh, in the, the past. Of the troubles. The danger is I think it's important that we moves on continue to learn from the evidence uh, of the impact of the troubles. Political issues the danger is that the, as the world moves on, of the as new generations come along, about. as my new uh, political issues preoccupy us, the long term consequences of the troubles are forgotten about. My concern is that the impact of the troubles, particularly from a mental health and social and family point of view, were not given the level of visibility within the peacemaking process. That say was policing, the, term the release of prisoners, of our and a number of other areas. Even though it's and really, the mental health of our still population is this. critical Making to the long-term well-being of a way our community. To the public, Even though it's late, we need to be still working hard at this. Making ourselves way. available in such a way to the public that reflects the needs of the public, and not in some kind of sterile, remote way. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am honored, I am humbled, and I get to lose it because I'm from New York and I'm the outsider, and you know New Yorkers were, were out there. Um, this research has been a long time coming in my collaboration with Joe, who I met in the aftermath of 9-11, and he was a visiting professor at NYU, and we talked about the experiences related to the troubles. And so I've been in it a long time, and I, Carolyn and I just spoke 
how long everybody has been in preparation and the labor of love to be able to produce this. So thank you so much because you're going to give so much to the social work world globally because of this. And uh, when Joe was getting the ethical approval, I felt like a kid on a ride with the parents saying, are we there yet, are we there yet? He'd say, soon, soon, it's very important. It took 18 months to get ethical approval here. At NYU, it took me nine days. So <laughs> that, that speaks to this. <laughs> so that speaks to the, the sensitivities. Um, now, I w I'm basically here because of my research around shared trauma, and which my interest grew from my experience at 9-11 when I was sitting with a patient when the first plane flew over the building. And I said to myself, oh my God, did anyone else go through this? And I started querying my different colleagues, and it led to a research project. Now, the big difference is we may have lost the same amount of people in the troubles in 9-11. 9-11 was a one-time event that happened in a matter of hours. And when uh, it's where a client and clinician go through the same collective trauma together. The big difference here is that my clients were paying me to listen to their stories as I had my narrative as well. But we were on the same side, so to speak. Whereas here, in terms of shared trauma, many of you, many of the interviews that I led were people were um, kind enough to let me be privy to their narratives. People were physically threatened. Um, some of the stories I have still have embedded in my mind, um, sitting down to, in someone's home and having a gun, you know, on the, on the sofa, you know, feeling for a gun, you know, that's kind of, nobody in New York has that experience, I can tell you. So that the sense of shared trauma isn't just a collective thing happening. Many of you personally felt that sense of threat. The amount of people who went through bomb scares, et cetera, helicopters overhead, on and on is, is astronomical. So you really further the idea of shared, con um, shared trauma. And it's all about the duality. It's you're not only impacted secondarily, as um, Jim mentioned, around vicarious trauma. You're impacted primarily. And the troubles, you're impacted in an extended way. And there's a legacy that continues to this day. One only needs to look at the you know, current political climate. Um, I've done research also um, in, um, by the Gaza Strip in southern Israel. And there they go through, there's terrorism, there's concern, but it isn't on a daily basis in an ongoing way that you will live through. So that's what shared trauma is. Oops, I, I'll let you do the clicker. Okay, I was clicking. I can't get that off, Don't, just ignore it. Okay, all right, all right, but here's really, um, how you further our understanding around shared trauma. So one is you expand the definition of it in the sense of the personal threat in addition to the collective violence that one was privy to. What was most striking in, the, in this research is the extent to which peer support, if you look at the graph you'll see in the findings, peer support was off the charts in terms of how people used to cope. A lot of people I know that I interviewed didn't want to burden their families. They didn't want to burden their children. They didn't want anyone worried about them. Who could understand better than your peers? A lot of black humor was used, you know, also to kind of get by with what was going on. Um, going socializing with somebody, going to the pub, debriefing, just um, stress relieving, that that was so key. And it's interesting because in 9-11, that really wasn't so much it. You could turn to your family. There wasn't an issue that you had to protect your loved ones, which brings you to further isolation. And in 9-11, um, in people were saying, we weren't educated properly. We didn't have the proper supervision. But what's so striking in the troubles is it was barely mentioned in terms of social work education at the time. Or my understanding is it's just really seeping in now. So there's so much to be told from that. Now, another thing that we learned, um, Jim mentioned post-traumatic growth. Um, a colleague and I developed a, a concept. It's an outgrowth of Tedeschi and Calhoun's work around post-traumatic growth. We call it professional post-traumatic growth. Now, post 9-11, we found that people, they took better care of themselves. 
Some people, they reduced their practices to part-time, they changed jobs, they got more training, they did things to make them feel better. But you guys are the model of professional post-traumatic growth. What is done, and through your narratives, what you can teach people who are in education now, who are learning social work, um, as well as globally. The idea, the extent to which you can turn to your colleagues, that's number one. Uh, two, in terms of self-care, that that is an important part of self-care that often gets overlooked. Um, another thing that's so striking is the sense of social work identity, how strong it is here. If one more person told me, just get on with it. Um, I was joking with Joe, I said, we've reached saturation. I interviewed five people. I interviewed nine people in total. By, by the fifth person, I said, I have saturation. Everybody's telling me the same stories. We don't need to go any further in this research because the extent to which the camaraderie and everyone went through it in, this, in the same way in the same time. But what's striking is the social work identity is so strong that it withstood everything you had to do on a daily basis. And as people said, the abnormal became normal. And so that said the sense of people needed me. Someone was counting on me today to do something. If I didn't go, who would go? Who would be there for people? So the idea that a, a core being wedded in one social work identity and seeing it as strong is, is it supersedes everything else and in many respects inoculates you to what you need to do. It's a way of immunizing you from all of the trauma that you need to face. So that was very strong. The idea that everyone was on a mission. It wasn't just social work and it was your job. People were on a mission and it was mission accomplished. Um, I heard of many stories of people who were helping despite what they had to go through. Now, now, what do you take from this in terms of education? Um, Joe now is taking the lead on a project we're doing at uh, NYU, and it's basically introducing, introducing students, it's in my trauma class, um, introducing them to service, I'm sorry, to service users of 9-11, victims of 9-11, people who are impacted, the survivors. And it's gonna be an educational tool for people to hear those narratives and to learn from those narratives. So one of the things that we hope to, um, to have an outcome from this, Carolyn, start getting the funding for this one, is basically um, an archive for the narratives, where basically these narratives can be kept, they can be used, if you will, in lieu of actually coming into a classroom, because social workers globally need to know what you did here. Because as we know, the world isn't getting nicer uh, it seems to be going in a different direction. And so those narratives, those stories are more important than ever for everyone to hear. Um, and also the idea that an acknowledgement, I think this research is so timely because what it does in some ways it's a safe enough space for this to come to the fore. But what's so clear being here is that the political climate, the idea around what's going on in terms of local government or lack of it, there's so much that not only students need to know, the people you, you work with and others need to know what's going on in Northern Ireland. Um, when I was telling colleagues about the research, they're like, well, but they have the Belfast, um, I'm sorry, the Good Friday Peace Agreement, everything's good over there, right? It's like, um, no, not necessarily. So the world, if you will, um, likes to think, it makes life easier to think that everything's copacetic and everything is good, but it continues to be a concern, and it takes into account differences around social strata, a lot of things of the populations we work with. So, um, you know, just in closing, I, my sincere appreciation um, for being allowed to be a part of this wonderful research, and I applaud you all and you have my deepest respect and appreciation for the work you've done and the lessons that will go forward thanks to you. So thank you guys so much.
Sorry, slight change to plan. Uh, Jim, or Joe, yeah. do you want to come and say a few more words? Okay. Yeah, Jim. We're not getting up to do a song, don't worry. <laughs> but uh, another important, as if we hadn't enough to do in this research, but um, another important strand of this research was to look at a very important publication back in 1999 called, aptly called, Getting Off the Fence. Okay? So we had a, a number of focus groups with experienced social workers, which was chaired by my colleague, Professor John Pinkerton, who's here. And uh, in many ways, Getting Off the Fence, it was originally published as a sort of navigational tool for us, to for us as social workers to deal with sectarianism in practice. And I suppose the findings from our focus groups would have very clearly said that that document was in many ways ahead of its time, and in many ways equally it has stood the test of time, but at the same time, and there's always a but, um, I think we're also saying, and the findings from our focus groups are very clearly saying, that we, we need to sort of future-proof that document in terms of its uh, ability going forward to continue forming that sort of compass for social work going forward post-1998 to be able to evidence the type of uh, anti-sectarian and anti-discriminatory practice that's needed in, in the context of the, the fact that policy has changed as well and we have moved on considerably in many ways since 1998. So again, I suppose our findings from reviewing Getting Off the Fence has now given us a basis for again, for going forward and looking at how social work practice is now moulding itself around the contours of being like a post-conflict society. So that was a, equally a very important piece of work. But I think as well we, we have to give credit to the fact that it was a very important publication just a year after the Good Friday Agreement. But we are going to move forward in terms of using that as the basis for hopefully a new study uh, where we will look at the, the challenges facing social workers currently. Um, I'm also, and I'm going to introduce Jim again just for a few seconds after this, we're delighted about the fact that we will have a new book as well looking at interna international perspectives on social work and political conflict and the study from Northern Ireland is forming the basis for that and Jim's going to say something more about that. And finally just to I would like to thank the funders. I'd like to thank the, it was Nyaswa at that stage, but it's now Baswa NI. Um, and again, just to echo what uh, Ruth had said about the important role that uh, Bridget Robb had in this work, the important role that Colm Conway had as well, and that, uh, that Patricia um, as well now is the interim chief executive of NISC. Carolyn and Patricia have been complete legends, if I could use that term to me as principal investigator in terms of leading this work. They have been excellent, they've been very supportive, and uh, you know we've been able to use our very strong professional relationship to navigate our way through some very challenging issues. This was a very challenging piece of research to undertake, but today I have to say I'm personally delighted with what we've done. So I'm gonna hand over now to Jim just to say a few more words about the book and then Carolyn will take over. Yeah, but very quickly, I know you have, there's somewhere we, we need to get moving on, and I've got a very important person coming to talk to us, uh, Rory. Um, yeah, the book is, we, we had a good think early on in the project about the fact that the, the Northern Ireland study is very, very important, of course, for all the reasons we've talked about today, but we also realised that we shouldn't be thinking in the sort of local, national, or national or local bubble, but the, there are lessons that we can learn from other situations of conflict, and they might be, be able to learn from us. So there is a book coming out, a co-edited book, edited by the three of us, published by Routledge later on in the year. And what it does is forefront the study that you've just heard about. And then there are other chapters from Palestine, Israel, uh, something on North America, um, some, some, someone from the Caucasus, Caucasus, one in Hong Kong, one, one in South Africa, and one in Bosnia, Herzegovina. So you're going to have, if you're really interested, there will be, I think there'll be a book launch somewhere later on in the year. And we hope you'll all turn up. And you might, you might even get discount. You might even get discount. But um, 
I think the key thing is that we need to learn from others, from the other international contexts, because you do hear of, unfortunately, hear of Northern Irish politicians going off around the world to tell everybody how it's done here, and I'm not sure whether that's a good message. We, it needs to be a dialogue among social workers across the world, and there, uh, there are about there are about twelve, there are twelve. Um, chapters and um, they're very powerful chapters topped and tail nicely with the Northern Irish study and a nice completing chapter by Rory Truel and his, and his work that he'll tell you about now. So look out for the next press release about the book. Thank you very much. Bagsy, Patricia, you and I don't organise that event. We'll just turn up if that's okay. We'll leave other people to organise that one, will we? Um, I just want to introduce to you the next few speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Rory Truel, or should I say Professor Rory Truel now? As I see on Twitter, you've been off and um, have been given a professorship. Uh, Rory is the General Secretary, Secretary General of the International Federation of Social Workers. Um, and he's travelled uh, a long way to be with us today. Uh, it's, I have to say, particularly apt that he's here at the launch of uh, this research study. I hope he won't mind me sharing a personal memory that actually Rory was there at the, the beginning of this um, idea, the genesis really of, of our involvement. I know lots of colleagues have been involved in very many ways in having discussions about sharing these stories, um, but it was at a colleague's retirement do, Ruth Stark, who's also here, um, as all the best conversations take place, as you know, uh, in the kitchen at parties late at night. And that's exactly where this idea started. Rory and I were introduced and had a conversation. Rory, I'm sure, will share with you. He's from Northern Ireland, but has spent most of his life in New Zealand. And we do as you do. You get talking, you share your experiences, you share your stories. And from that, we developed the idea of getting together this archive of stories through conversations with others and with Bridget Rove, who's been mentioned here, had conversations with Jim and Joe, it became a much bigger project. But it's really apt that you're here um, as we launch today because you were there at the beginning. Once Rory has spoken, um, we're delighted to say that uh, Jackie McElroy from uh, the Office of uh, Social Services of the Department of Health is going to share some observations and some comments as well. And then Patricia Higgins is going to bring it all to a close for us. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Rory. Oh, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm here officially from the International Federation of Social Workers, which comprises organisations like uh, NIASWA and BASWA, but from throughout the world. So I'm speaking to you today from the, from the international perspective, not from your local perspective. And the very first thing that I want to say to you is bravo. What a, what a wonderful achievement. Uh, you should be so proud, and you are making a significant contribution, not just here in Northern Ireland, but to your colleagues from throughout the world. There are so many people to acknowledge for this important piece of research, um, but I'm not going to name the people I know. You know that I know who you are. I'm just going to give all of my acknowledgement to the participants who gave information in this piece of research. I really want to say you're heroes to me. You're heroes to the International Federation of Social Workers because you've taken these brave steps to do this. And I know and we know from our international experience that it takes a lot of courage to do so. IFSW wants to acknowledge you and we want to acknowledge all social workers that have been through war, through dictatorships, through civil wars, and through occupations. We also want to make a formal public apology to you today. So from the International Federation of Social Workers, I am formally using this occasion to publicly apologise to social workers, 
in conflict zones and who are contributing to peace building for not having the policies, the guidance, and making your role visible internationally in the past decades. There is not one policy for the profession at the global level which has recognised the challenges of your work. I stand before you and I say this is not acceptable. We know that in your roles you put yourselves at risk to support vulnerable people, to support children, to support your colleagues, to support your profession, and we want to acknowledge that we weren't there to support you. We apologise. Paradoxically, the modern profession of social work actually started from the context of war. It started around World War I with the social workers reaching across international boundaries and wanting to support each other and wanting to support the refugees that were dislocated through the war of the First World War and find ways to support them. But since our very honourable beginning as a global profession, where we are fully aware of the role of social workers, our profession has unfortunately become blind at the global level to the role of social work in war and conflict. Our learning from you from this is opening our eyes. It's going to change what happens at the international policy level. It's going to change the information that social workers are taught in social work schools. It's going to change the narrative and understanding. And it's not going to let what happened to you happen to other people in war and conflict situations. We are learning many things from you, and we are learning many things from social workers in other countries that have experienced war and conflict and military division. We know that social workers in these contexts create safe spaces. We know that they help people to regain hope when hope is lost. We know that they help people to walk a journey beyond violence, beyond today into a vision of a new life. A journey that brings dignity, it brings hope, and it brings the possibility for people to contribute to rebuilding a new society. There are many stories of social workers doing this throughout the world, and they are all emerging now. Every social work story is different, as every person we work with is different. But within every social work story, there are parts that are similar and parts that are the same. It is so typical of social workers in war zones to be doing things like working with teachers to help them recognise the trauma of the children in their class and to know how to respond to it. It's typical of social workers to be advocating that the TV stations do not show the bombing of their communities before the children's bedtime. It is very typical of social workers to run workshops with teenagers who have trauma, but the workshops are focused on stopping the eye for an eye repetition of violence to helping those young people to find new meaning peaceful resistance and peaceful strategies for moving ahead. Perhaps the most challenging part that we hear from social workers around the world is that within their own communities, 
that they work within. They play the role of humanising the opposition, of humanising the opponent of the community that they work within, of recognising that human rights belong to all equally. And in that message of humanisation and rights for all is the absolute seed for reconciliation and peace. And social workers throughout the world, your colleagues, people just like you, have ended up being able to make significant contributions to peace. I'm going to touch on one or two examples. Now, I'm not, I haven't worked through the Troubles. I'm an outsider to the Troubles. I'm not going to talk to you about examples from the Troubles. There's only one group of people that can do that, and that is you, not me. But I've been asked to share some stories from your colleagues, your sisters and brothers who are social workers in other countries. And they want me, on their behalf, to share those stories in the spirit of solidarity, shared learning, and also with the message that social workers are not alone. I'm going to start with El Salvador. El Salvador is in Central America. And 25 years ago, about the same time as the Easter Peace Agreement, their civil war came to an end. It was a terrible civil war. Both sides of the civil war had a tactic of recruiting child soldiers. And you may remember the scenes on television of little children carrying the machine guns, marching through the streets of El Salvador. It is still a, a society working through this level of intergenerational violence caused by these child soldiers. The war also brought El Salvador into extreme poverty. And so we wanted to learn from social workers with not quite the same elaborate research as, as being conducted here, but we wanted to start a conversation with the social workers of El Salvador and ask them, what did they do? What happened to them in that war situation? So the IFSW president, who is here, Silvana Martinez, and I, we went to San Salvador, the capital, and asked social workers what happened. I'm just going to read a quote. This is from a social worker in El Salvador, sitting in a group of women. They were all women social workers. And as she was talking, a very emotional experience for them. All the others were nodding. She said, it was not easy. We could see nothing good coming from the violence. The politicians couldn't find answers. So we had to do something. We brought communities that were killing each other together. Unofficially, of course. If we did it officially, we could have been killed. We didn't want the communities to agree with each other. We didn't want them to find an answer to their problems. All we wanted them to do was talk to each other. We hoped that they might learn to respect one another we hoped that they might try and find a way for non-violence. So Silvana and I said the next question. Did it work? Was it successful? The social worker replied, Ah, well, when we see social workers from these communities now, 25 years later, they tell us, we help them move away from violence. We see, new po we see new possibilities. When the military leaders were able to establish a fragile ceasefire, something happened. The social workers that were working with this community and this community, they were able to come together onto the streets and have a public demonstration calling together 
for peace for all. The social worker remarked, this coming onto the streets together was an important part of ending the violence in El Salvador. We asked some colleagues from Bosnia what social workers did there. Different story. In Bosnia, many of the rural villages, the men were all gone. The men had died in the war, and it left entire villages of women, widows, and children. The hospitals were gone. The social services were gone. The roads were gone. And so social workers that worked or lived or travelled through these villages were able to support a process where the women, the, the widows, would develop their own informal social services, where they were able to come together and learn systems and put the systems in place to support one another. These informal systems of support help the community at a community level find a direction and uh, an aspiration and a motivation which helped them with their trauma. Another story, Rwanda. You remember Rwanda? A million people died, very short period of time, two tribes fighting each other. When there was a new government in Rwanda that had gained power by military, power, uh, by military force to end the war, the country was still an immense pain and chaos. The politics were so dry, a small flame could ignite that war any moment. And the social workers, your colleagues, had a suggestion for the government, which the government adopted. And that was to introduce an old tribal custom where a village chief would issue everyone in conflict with a cow. The Rwandan colleagues told me that a cow is more than milk, it's more than breeding, it's more than meat, it's a symbol of status in their culture. Through everybody, being, every family being issued a cow, which was initiated by social workers and administered by social workers, it created a context, a new beginning for that society where everybody was treated the same, where everybody had the same equal rights. Now, as I'm listening to your stories sitting here, feeling very emotional, by the way, I'm listening and I'm hearing that you were struggling to treat everybody the same. You were putting your social work principles first. So were they in Rwanda. So were they in Bosnia. So were they in El Salvador. It's the social work principles in action. Palestine. Late last year, we had the opportunity where a Palestinian social worker, a prominent Palestinian social worker, wanted to talk about social work and the Palestinian approach to social work under occupation. He'd been released from two days from prison for a non-violent action of supporting children's rights in custody. And this is what he said. He wanted to talk about the Palestinian approach of social work. People need to know that social workers are working for all people. Whatever their religion, their race, males, females, Arabs, Jews, Muslims, Christians, we are trying to create and direct hope for all people. We don't want people to go back into a cycle of violence. If we leave people without caring for them, without creating hope for them, they will go back into a cycle of violence. 
to send people into armed resistance would be a disaster. We will lose more and more people. We will lose children, we will lose mothers, we will lose fathers. The idea for us as social workers is doing non-violent activities. We will struggle in Palestine, but we will struggle with social work principles for non-violence. All of these examples, and your examples, which I've been learning about, particularly through Carolyn, for the last few years, have helped another group of social workers who are in a military conflict war right now, from Yemen. Yemen, as you might know, is probably the biggest uh, cat uh, human, human catastrophe at this moment in time. But there are social workers there who are putting these principles into place. They're bringing communities together where there are no hospitals, no social services, no roads, no police. They are bringing communities together to rebuild a sense of a community direction. They are learning these things from you. They will learn a lot more after reading this report and seeing these videos because what we haven't been able to touch on as outsiders to working directly with conflict is the human experience. We're not able to, in the way that you are, share the tears, understand what it means, know what silence means. And the videos, the stories, will help tremendously and powerfully in these situations. I just want to conclude by saying your stories, your colleagues' stories, they recognise the profession's principles. They recognise the dignity in everyone. They recognise the extreme dangers that social workers face. Social workers responding to trauma, their own trauma, the trauma of the community. Social workers performing an essential part in the peace building process. I started by saying I formally, on behalf of the International Federation of Social Workers, apologise to each one of you and to each one of the people in my examples and to every social worker in a war zone. With an apology comes an action. The action will be that we will take your stories, we will take what you've given, what you've offered to colleagues around the world, we will develop with you and with them policies, guidelines, we will make your work, the work in Yemen, the work in other war zones visible, and they will know that they're not alone. Thank you so much. Hasn't this been a really powerful afternoon? Tremendous, um, very, very emotional. Uh, I suppose it has brought back so many memories for me as someone who actually worked in North and West Belfast during the Troubles. Um, the aftermath of the Shangri-La bomb, working in the middle of our join during the, uh, the Holy Cross School and the riots and the Troubles that happened then. But I suppose some of the things that I actually remember was actually the the kindness that was shown by the people who we worked with. The phone calls you got to say, you know, don't come into this area today, you may not be safe. Or the, um, the night I got a phone call from uh, a community worker who I'd been working with and who um, said, um, you're talking at a public meeting tonight. First thing you must do is give my apologies that I can't be there. And I thought that's very strange because he'd organised the meeting. And I thought, well, why, why is he doing that? And I discovered afterwards it was about giving a message to the community that I, I was okay. 
because he had heard that I might not be safe that night. So I think this so it's, it's quite emotional. But so I do think that there's something about um, remembering those times and learning from those experiences. But you know, we didn't talk, and we didn't talk about what was going on, but we didn't talk as a society. You know, social workers didn't come and were sorts of we weren't bust in from some outside planet. We lived in those communities. We were part of it. You know, our, our loved ones went to work. You know, um, we were out at night time. We didn't know when our bomb would go off or what would happen. So it was a very, you know, it was a difficult time. And we did what we had to do to keep safe. But, you know, there's so much we can learn from that. And, and today, tonight, a young man may be going and he may have a punishment shooting. And some social workers will know that family, they will know that person. And what do we, as a social work profession, do about that? What are we saying about ending that harm? What are we saying about that this is wrong and should have stopped in our society? You know, our society has not yet healed. And we as a profession have got a responsibility to stand up for those young people, to go and support them, to support their families, and to actually stand up as a profession and say, this is not right and it should not continue. So I'm very, very proud of the social work profession. I'm really proud when I hear the stories of what social workers are doing across the world because I think that we as a profession, we do our best. It's not always seen to be that way, but we do do our best. So I'm really, really thankful for this research. I think it's a very important piece of research and we in the department really endorse it. And I know in the following weeks we're going to have lots of conversations about how we progress this agenda. I'm also going to say a great thank you to all of our academic colleagues because, you know, we're really lucky in Northern Ireland. We have fantastic social work academics and we've got great collaboration between all the different parts of our system and we're extremely lucky with that. So I just say a big thank you to all involved. Um, we're really, really very delighted that you actually did this work and we will progress it as you've asked. Thank you. Well, I had exactly the same words here as uh, Jackie. What a very powerful afternoon. I feel the emotion as well, and I, and I think it was Jim who said, you can feel it palpably in the room, and, and that is right. I could, even sitting at the, the front here today, I think it's slightly taken my breath away, and it may well have done that with others. It's about upping the game, increasing the debate, and providing the evidence. Those were the words used by Mary on one of the videos to express the importance of today's research. And we hope that this is exactly what Voices of Social Work Through the Troubles will do. I also worked as a social worker through the troubles and the stories and experiences related in the research and shared through the videos today have resonated with me as I'm sure they have with all of you. We all have our own stories to tell about how we normalized the abnormal and how we just got on with it. This research is important in giving space and time for reflection for those of us who practiced through those times to acknowledge what we did and the impact that it had on us as people as well as as practitioners. But it's also important for the future and we've talked a lot about that today. We know that we continue to live with the legacy of the troubles and the participants in the research have recognized the important role of this work in learning from the past to inform our practice today and into the future. Mary Therese O'Hagan from the Wave Trauma Centre has written an introductory uh, section to the, to the research. You will see it when you get the document. And in her introductory remarks to this research, she said, in relation to legacy issues, many voices in this report reflected that social work not only has a role to play in contributing to those legacy issues, but is actually best placed to do so. Voices of social work through the troubles is not an end in itself. It's just the start of the journey. Mary Trez goes on to say, social workers who practiced through the troubles believe they have much to offer current students and those working in a very different Northern Ireland society today. Their learning, their wisdom and their resilience needs to be shared. 
And you've heard that in the research group, we have begun to discuss how we continue on this journey, capturing oral histories and using the research to further influence social work practice and indeed considering what further research would be beneficial. So this is not the end. It's just the start of the journey. Now, it falls to me to, um, to say some thanks and to close the event, but we've been having a lot of thanks today, and I sort of begin to feel a bit like a love-in, so I'm going to just do this quite quickly. I think we've thanked a lot of people. So I would, in particular, clearly like to thank the researchers, Joe and Jim and Carol, who unswervingly um, and unstintingly led this research. And you've heard that it was a long journey and 18 months to get ethical approval, and it was at times difficult. <laughs> Um, but they stayed with it, um, and their sensitivity in taking us through this piece of research was absolutely brilliant, and we pay real tribute to the three researchers. I'd I'd also like to thank all the contributors today, everybody who provided an input. It was really powerful today. And also the use of the video clips. And thank you to Slack Press, the um, organization, the, the, the guys who, who produce these wonderful videos but never really get any recognition. So thank you, Slack Press. <laughs> and of course, the teams who make all this happen. Carolyn and I have all the ideas, but other people put it into practice. Um, and sometimes curse us for the ideas that we have, but they put it into practice. Um, I'm not going to name everybody. They know who they are, as Rory had said, used that expression before. So thank you to the teams in, in Basel, Northern Ireland, particularly Amanda. I will mention Amanda. Um, and thank you to the team in the Social Care Council as well. <laughs> but finally, and we have said it before, but I really want to say it again. I would like to thank all of the social workers who took part in the research. Thank you for being courageous in stepping up to tell your story, to giving voice to your experiences, and to showing us all just how important a role the social work profession played during the Troubles. Without you, this research would not have been possible. So ladies and gentlemen, can we give a resounding round of applause for our amazing social workers? I realise that we have run over typical social workers, never on time. So we have refreshments for you. Please take some refreshments before you start your journey home. And if you have time, the museum have kindly offered um, a tour of the Troubles and Beyond exhibition. If you have time to do that, please avail of it. Safe journey home.